I've made more mistakes than anybody and I'm willing to talk about it. So when somebody asks me a question and I answer their question based on all of my mistakes, they think, oh, you're so wise. And I, and I, and I laugh and I'm like, the only reason I'm wise is because I've made so many mistakes in every area. Well, guys, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, I'm super excited to have this chat today with Bob. Bob Hassan, he is over in the US and he'll tell you a little bit more in a minute. But Bob's got a phenomenal business career over a long period of time, longer than I've been alive actually. And, uh, and, uh, and he's built something significant. Uh, and along that journey of his deep walk with the Lord, he's, he's learned a lot of things, um, you know, handles on how to walk with the Lord and how to build a business that changes culture and things like that. So I'm really excited about today's chat. Bob's got a book out uh, called Shortcuts, which we're going to get into. Um, I really want to tease you with this because it's brilliant. Uh, but one of the things I want to do straight at the top of the show is this. Uh, I'm buying a bunch of copies from Bob, and I'm going to be giving a bunch of these out to you guys in the comments. So as the show progresses, as you hear what Bob's saying, I want you to think, okay, what's jumping out to me on this episode? And then I want you to put those in the comments and I'll just pick 10 random comments that I think are really cool. I'll reach out to you and then I'll send a book to you no matter where you are in this world. Hey, Bob, it's so good to have you here. Why don't you introduce yourself to the Kingdom Business Nation? Well, Wes, first of all, I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And what a cool idea to pass out books. Um, uh, and I love the Kingdom Podcast Nation. So yeah, I've I've had my business. I'm a, sub, a subcontractor in the construction business for 45 years. Um, I started out in a little Volkswagen bug in 1978. And here I am all these years later with a mature business. And I wasn't smart enough to be one of those uh, serial entrepreneurs, but I just kind of put one foot in front of the other and tried to serve the Lord all the way through the growth cycles. Um Sort of in 2017, a really good friend of mine named Danny Silk, who you know, uh, asked me to write a book with him, which I did. And I'd been one of those guys, Wes, that I was, I was a business guy. I was in the church. I was behind the scenes. I supported nonprofits. I gave, consulted with people. And um, I was really happy with that in, until the Lord called me out and said, hey, um, you've got something to say, and I want you to say it, which was a big struggle for another, for another time, but I was obedient to the Lord and to Danny and have uh, authored books as well as running a business, which if you would have, if you would have told me, uh, you know, seven years ago that you'd be an author, I'd say, well, what are you smoking? Cause I don't even write long emails. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. Well, I think brevity is the key to life. Um, so t give us a little bit more on this business. Um, I, you know, I know that it's, uh, it's a pretty significant business in the southern yeah. half of North America. Um, but, but I just want people to catch the fact that, you know, you have built something significant. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of voices, I think, in this space, and you've actually built a business over a long period of time. Give us, just give us a little bit on, um, I think it's RM Hassan Contractors yeah. or Painting. Like, give us a bit of a handle on that business. So it's uh, Hassan Inc. Painting Contractors, and... Uh, we, at this point in time, we're in uh, four or five sectors. We're in the healthcare sector, which means new hospitals. We're in the aviation sector, which means uh, new airports. Uh, we're in the entertainment sector, which means new hotels. And then, uh, I'm sorry, entertainment sector means new arenas and stadiums. And then uh, the hospitality sector, which is new hotels. So we do all new construction, uh, new projects. And we're in the top... Um, half a percent of businesses of painting subcontractors in the United States. Pretty much what sets us apart is our uh, longevity in business and the fact that we've built our balance sheet to a point where we can get bonded on these really large projects. Um, the largest construction project that we've done is uh, $6 billion. That wasn't our, that wasn't our painting contract, but it was, was the size of work we do are in the billions. So we're seeing these these incredible construction uh, projects happening all over the country, and it's it's been amazing. I'm I'm really really passionate about my team and the people. 
Uh, so I'm a relationship guy. And, you know, as we, as the business built from me swinging a paintbrush to where we are now, I was always building relationships with uh, people that I work with, with customers, with vendors and with partners. And I've had uh, some partner vendor relationships for over 30 years. And the times have gotten tough over the years where I thought I was gonna go bankrupt and I had to go to these people and say, hey, can you help me work out a payment plan so I can stay in business? And, and, um, and I think that's the value of, of being a service company and building relationships uh, you know, through, the, through the length of your career. So good. So you're, that sounds like you're doing purely commercial work, but did you, did you start just by doing Aunt, Aunt Mary's back bedroom? Is that how it started? <laughs> Yeah, so I, you would call me Wes and say, can you come paint my living yeah. room? And so if I told you that I was going to show up at 8 a.m., I would. If I told you it was going to be $50, it would be $50. And then before I left, I cleaned up. I hung your drapes back up, moved your furniture back, even tried to find your vacuum and vacuum the carpet. So when you came home, the only way you knew I was there was that the walls were a different color. Hey, are you enjoying this episode? It would mean the world to me if you would subscribe, like, comment, and share. It helps build the algorithm so that we can get this message out to more people. See, here's the thing. We don't have these fancy sponsors. It's me paying the bills to get this show to you. So do me a favor in return, would you? Subscribe, like, comment, and share. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, that's so cool because what I love and, and I think your book alludes to this, is like a lot of people get frustrated in that early stage. They might see the big lights, like I'm going to build a big commercial painting business one day, but they get real hung up on the little job. I'm nowhere near I want to be. You know, it's, it's too slow. You know, I've been in business 12 months and I'm not killing it, right? You know, and, and my standard response to those people is, well, that's good. You're about a quarter of the way through your apprenticeship if you've done one year. Right. So, so I guess, you know, I just like the fact that, you know, from your perspective, you're now looking backwards and, and it was probably many years, right. Of Aunt Mary's back bedroom before you got some big breaks. Um, but I think I read that it was about 2008 that things really kicked off for you. Is that, is that right? Yeah. I mean, I have been in business 30 years. And, and I, I hit, you know, well, the American metaphor is baseball singles and doubles. And, and, you know, I'd never hit a home run or a grand slam. I, we just, you know, just struggled for all those years to make payroll, to having cash flow problems, um, putting out a good product. And yeah, in 2008, uh, in the, in the height of the recession, uh, we, we landed all these big jobs and everything changed. Uh, so so when I hear people say what you said, like, hey, I'm 28 years old and I'm not a millionaire, or I've been in business six months or 12 months and I can't believe it's so hard. It's, it's uh, to me, uh, if business was easy, everybody would be doing it and everybody be making a profit. It's not easy. And, and I think if you have the passion to start a business and run a business, operate a business, you're in for some really hard times, but the fact that we have the Lord on our side makes it easier. I can't figure out how some of these Fortune 50 business people, uh, CEOs, are making these hard decisions. And without the Lord, I, I get anxious with the Lord. I can't figure out how, how, how that can happen. So this is where uh, you know, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 comes in for me over and over and over again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding and all, acknowledge him in all your ways, and he'll direct your paths. I have to actually put the situation in there instead of trust the Lord with all your heart, trust the Lord with this particular job or this particular situation. Uh, that's, that's how I try to manage my life. That's so good. Uh, all right. Well, uh, so you've got a book called Shortcuts. Um, why don't you just give us like the, the 30 second on how did this come about? What was the reason for writing it? What are you hoping to achieve? Over my entire life, I've, I'm a, I've told you I'm a relationship guy. I've talked to people and the older I've gotten, the more younger the people have been. And I hear, and I just hear like, what's my purpose? What's, what's my passion? What's my calling? And I hear this general angst of like, how come it's not happening so fast? 
And what is God's uh, view on, on economy? What's God's economy? In, in Genesis uh, 2-7, God breathes life into Adam. The very next thing he says to him in verse 15 is, go tend to the garden or go to work. And, and so I, I just, you know, think, wow, that's amazing. And then, you know, all the way in John 5, 17, Jesus says, my father and I are always working. And so I, I see this bookended, uh, 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 um, these statements about God's economy. And what we don't hear enough from the pulpit is that, you know, work is righteous. We have the sacred from the pulpit and the secular for all the rest of the 99% of us who are out working, having jobs. And, and the fact is, is that we're to bring our light to shine before us in, in our jobs. We all have jobs. And, and so how do we bring our character? How do we, how do we, how do we uh, shine before others? Well, I have one way, get to work early complete your tasks, ask other people on your team if they need help, go to your supervisor and say, hey, listen, I'm finished. Is there anything I can do to help you? And if you do that, you're better than 98% of the people in the workforce. That's what's going to set you apart. Past that, maybe get passionate about building relationships within your team, not necessarily evangelizing, but loving people on your team. And if there's if there's if you have a supervisor that is just oh so hard to work with they're so angry they're so unfair well do an experiment pray for them for 2 weeks and see what happens they probably won't change but your heart will change because you'll understand that um, that they're probably going through something major in their personal lives cuz no one i've not found anyone that wants to be a jerk at work i just haven't and, and so us as believers have this opportunity to, to, to really do the stuff uh, that Jesus talks about in his book. I mean, you, you touched on some, some pretty old school values in, in that little minute. And in a world where everyone's trying to outsource and leverage, uh, mm -hmm. you're just cutting through with, with the old timeless stuff of caring and being kind and going the extra mile and serving people. And... Right. Um, are you saying that stuff still works, Bob? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> yeah, I am. It still works. I mean, we look at social media and we see people's highlight reels and they're standing in front of a yacht or a mansion or a nice car or they're on vacation somewhere. And we all think, gosh, why aren't we doing that? And, and, and the truth of the matter is, is that Life is a journey and a process, and, and we have to try to figure out this work-life balance, Wes, that, that what does it look like? Well, for most of us, we get a week's vacation in the summer, a week in the winter, um, so we go decompress there. But how do we, how do we engage God in the day-to-day, -day, in the every week? So we, most of us work eight hours a day, sleep eight hours a day which leaves eight hours a day for, you know, whatever we, whatever our passions are. If you don't work for a company that has great social justice causes or has uh, a nonprofit that has a mission in those eight hours, you can explore the things you're passionate about. Um, it's, it's, it's not a modern concept to, uh, to figure these things out because God wants us to enjoy all of our lives. He doesn't want us to be, compartmentalize one way at church, one way at home, one way at work. Mm -hmm. He wants our total self to be submitted to him and his precepts. And, and that's what me and a lot of my friends are working towards. And it's, it never stops. <laughs> We're always learning. Yeah. Uh, I love it. Such a good answer. All right. So in the book, you mentioned two groups of people, <clears throat> and I've written them down, right? You've got the, the Sabrinas, the Lancers, and the Pastor Lewises. And then you've got the Knicks, the Katrinas, and the Victors. Um, without giving too much away, because I want people to go buy the book on Amazon, uh, what, um, what are those two groups and what do they speak to? Well, the second group are actual young people that I know, that I've interviewed, that are 
that are living their lives out of God's destiny. They're asking Lord for to partner with them and they're moving through their businesses. Katrina is a farmer. Nick is a, 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 a in finance. Victor's in banking. A little bit later in the book, Chris is getting his master's degree in theology and Addie is a singer. And so we, I kind of talk to these people and find out like, why are you killing it right now? What, what is this thing? How did you figure this out? And, you know, I can just, you don't have to buy the book. I'll just tell you the pursuing wisdom is the shortcut, whether wisdom from God, wisdom from the Bible, wisdom from older people or more experienced people. This is the common denominator that all these successful people are, are after. The first subset of group is a compilation of people that, you know, I, I, I formed into this thing that, and they aren't looking for wisdom. They're looking for how can I get to this certain place and, or they've listened to bad advice. And some of the, some of these people, you know, I love them, but it's, it's been, they're a case study in what not to do. So, so I think, you know, in shortcuts, there's a juxtaposition of, of the Lances and the Sabrinas and the Nicks and the Victors, et cetera. And, you know, what's the difference? The reader can find the difference. And, and I think they will easily. Yeah, I mean, there are some clear character traits, right, that separate these two groups, right? Yes. And, and the second group, which you use their real names, right, which is amazing because they're legitimate people and stories, and, and, they're, and they're out there planning, working really, yes. really hard, achieving, yeah. listening to the Lord, listening to the world, learning, like adding to their knowledge base. And the first group, who you change their names to protect them, you know, they are maybe driven by self-interest, um, shortcuts, as you would say, and, um, and, and, and really struggle to set a plan and go build it. And they're all over the place is, is kind of the distinctions I got between those two character traits. Well, that's so good. I'm, I'm glad you picked that up. Um, the second group are planners. They've written strategic plans. They've altered them. When things go wrong, as they always do in business, they, they see what's happening and they go find their mentors. They talk to people. They, they try to figure it out. They're asking the Lord, you know, what do I do now? And, you know, the, these, these stories, being in business is hard. Like I said, you, you, you come into these situations that you could never have expected. You're, you're going along and all of a sudden you're being sued by an employee for sexual discrimination, racial discrimination, something that, like, wait a second, we built, a, we built this business on a culture of love. How, how can this happen? And there's just all these unintended consequences that happen in the world that you have to be prepared for. And so one of the first things I ask young people in business, do you have insurance? Do you have the proper licenses? Do you have a good banking relationship? Do you know what your P&L says? And, and if people are on the path of learning these things, they're on the path. They're on, they're on the path of of growing, and and where I see people stop growing. When I see people stop growing, then I see kind of these problems, these stagnant problems happen. What I love so much about this book, um, and you, of course, is the way that you approached it. Like there's there's no shame, there's no judgment, there's no finger pointing. Um, which is pretty common in modern books. Um, and, and of course, it just flows out of you. you, you I mean, you know, my listeners will be able to pick it up. You are uh, incredibly fathering, um, uh, like kind, humble, a, a huge encourager. Um, and, and I don't know whether you've always been like that. I would like to have seen Bob 45 years ago when he first started his business, because I reckon there might be some refining that's taken place over 45 years, but, but, um, but I've watched your content, you know, before I've ever spoken to you and it's the same there. Like this is not a Bob show that he does for podcasts. Like it's, it's consistent every single time. And I, I just think that that's a, it's a, it's a bit of a lost art today. You know, you, you just, even just talking to you, there's this real nurture and fathering that, that comes out of, out of what you say, not only the wisdom of what you say, but just how you approach it. And I, I just massively appreciate it. I think it's, I think it's a beautiful thing. 
and, uh, and I will intend to be more like you in the future. Um, why do you think society wants shortcuts so much? What, what, why do you think, like it, our Bible tells us that, w- w- that we should chase long suffering, right? Like you couldn't get any different. Like the Bible talks about long suffering being in there to endure for the long haul. And our current world wants nothing but, but hacks and the quick fix. So why do you think that is? Well, let me go back to something you said. Uh, um, the reason that I am the way that I am is because the grace of God has saved me. And when people say that I'm wise or someone's wise, here's my answer. I've made more mistakes than anybody and I'm willing to talk about it. So when somebody asks me a question and I answer their question based on all of my mistakes, they think, oh, you're so wise. And I, and I, and I laugh and I'm like, the only reason I'm wise is because I've made so many mistakes in every area. But God's had grace and mercy on me. And so I feel like because of his lavish love for me, the fact that, that he's had so much grace on me, I have to give it away. And if this is what it sounds like, it does. It does because I'm so grateful to God for what he's done for me. The answer to this question is, uh, I have a friend who's a video gamer, and he, he, he was telling me about these cheat codes. Well, what's a cheat code? Well, it's a, you can pay something and you can get to the next level without having to go through the, through the whatever, the current level. And I said to him, well, don't you, learn, don't you learn something at the next level? Like if you jump it? He goes, oh, yeah, you get killed all the time when you jump levels, but, but you're still at that level. And I, I just laughed. It's like, okay. And so life hacks have come out like, hey, we're going to give you a life hack or we're going to give you this quick fix so you can you know, figure out your life. In my world, which uh, is charismatic, um, we'll go to a conference. I have this friend who, who's, uh, who's, uh, who p- prays for healing and has really good success. And people come up to him all the time and say, could you pray for me and anoint me with your gift of healing? And he smiles at him and he says, yes, I will. Go pray for 8,000 people and then come back and see me and I'll pray for you. And every time he does it, I laugh because people are like, what? I have to go do the work? Yes, you do. This is the way you're going to learn. And, and I think society, because of social media, the fast pace of society is looking for these quick fixes, which... And, you know, sometimes God will do that for us. Some, we've seen people supernaturally healed. We've seen people get incredible contracts, businesses grow, what have you. God can do anything. But in my life, it's taken decades. And most of my friends, it's been a long building also. So I think one of the things, hopefully, that Shortcuts will show people is that there is a proven path to growth, to purpose, to excellence. And it's through... Um, through this process and journey called life. I mean, the Apostle Paul talks about his struggle with the Lord and, and, and it drove him to seek more wisdom, right? And, and I think, you know, that's, that's the opposite of shortcuts is the struggle which we're trying to get out of our life. Um, right. It's the struggle where we learn to hear God's voice. Right? I mean, okay, I'll talk about me for a minute. That's where I learned to hear God's voice. You know, right. I, I'm too busy with my own voice when it's going well. But 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 um, but you learn to hear. You know, you learn you learn to 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 lean on Him and not your own understanding. You, you learn yeah. to read Scripture in a new way because you need some answers. You know, yeah. and, and and so all the shortcuts mean that you don't build that baseline. You, you know. And then, and then often if you do get to the top of the mountain and you haven't built the baseline, then you're going to find yourself at the bottom of the mountain real soon. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the opposite of shortcuts, right? Yeah. What, what I've noticed um, about leaders, whether they're in the ministry or in the business world or in government or politics, is the isolation that comes with success. And so for me and my wife, we've always had a small group in our house. We've been married 34 years. We've always had a small group in our house. We have a core group of close friends, each one of us does, so that when when these life things happen, um, we can turn to these covenant relationships and say, am I crazy? You know, and the really good friends say, yeah, you're crazy. Uh, But you, you have people in relationship to turn to. And I think, you know, if I was to 
I think one of the most important things you can do is have these these great relationships so that, so that as life happens, as business happens, um, we we can turn to our friends in the kingdom and and have them care for us. I'm not talking about accountability. I'm not talking. I'm talking about relationship. And and I see lots of people take shortcuts through that too, where they well they just, hey, I'm too busy for all these reasons, and I, I I don't have a group of friends so that when things happen, when business turns, when life turns, when tragedy happens, there's no one to turn to, and. I think flesh and blood is the, the interesting thing. Uh, Paul writes in Ephesians: we don't battle against flesh and blood. We uh, we battle against powers and principalities and rulers of the air. So we're in this battle as believers, anyway. And we need people. We need covenant relationships in order for us to you know move forward. Yeah. That's so good. Um, you just mentioned the word covenant, and I wanted to pick up on that because a little bit later in the book, it gets a bit heavier where you talk about, you know, one of the kind of antidotes to this shortcut world is to get into covenant. So tell us about that in, in the context of shortcuts and, and, and playing for the long game, what role does covenants play? Well, when we think of covenant, we automatically think about either with the Lord or marriage. We're in covenant with our wife. We've stood up, we've taken vows, or, or our spouses, we've taken vows, but you know, there's relationships that I have. I mean, I don't know how to explain it more than, you know, would you take a bullet for that person? Okay, that's extreme. Would you get out of bed at midnight and go to their house and take them to the hospital if they're having an emergency? Would you fill in the blank? And these are covenant relationships that that I think God intended for us. He did not intend for us to be isolated. There's a, there's a writer here in, in uh, the U S his name is Stephen Mansfield. And he wrote this beautiful little book called the 10 signs of a leadership crash. And it's just a, it's just a little, it's just a little book, but the number one sign or the major sign that he identifies is isolation. So when, when life gets tough, and you can fill in the bank blank with the tragedy or the situation or the issue, people have a tendency to isolate and to not talk about it. And this is where addiction comes from, whether it's gambling or pornography, alcohol or drugs. We're trying to fill this thing in our heart that's so out of control that we can't control. We can't control the fact that we're going bankrupt. We can't control the fact that our wife's leaving us or one of our kids has perished. These, there are these things that happen. And, and we need, we need to, you know, the Bible calls it iron sharpening iron. We need to be in relationship. You know, it's interesting because the world's way, their wisdom is to become independently wealthy. And, and they're yes. trying to build like a fortress around themselves where they don't need anybody. I like the Bible says, don't, don't be an island under yourself. Right. And so the thing, and, and I think a lot of believers in business who haven't caught this revelation are just following a similar version without realizing that, Further down the line, it's incredibly dangerous. We were, we were meant to be in constant community with, with people. But I mean, you know, that's, that's the culture that we're up against, right? Is that everyone's trying to become so self-sufficient that they don't yes. need anybody. And then in that isolation, what you're saying is it leads to a whole bunch of social decay. So what they thought was going to be a blessing ends up being a curse. Right. They're, they're trying to be independent when, when what the Bible says, talks about is being interdependent. I hear people say, you know, I'm a self-made man. And if I sat down and I have with people that have said that and reverse engineered it, someone somewhere has helped them. Someone some there has, somewhere has given them seed capital or venture capital someone somewhere has helped them they've had a partner there's you know famous companies uh who have a, a a very popular founder had us had someone who was the brains behind it and so i think we really have to fight uh fight against this independent spirit that the world puts out there and look into being interdependent with each other that's a great point wes i, I, I think it's it's a trap and it's so luring. It's so luring to chase, I don't, you know, especially when, when you've got a big team and lots of demands and you want some separation, but it's, it's going to end up in tears and it does for many people. I want to go back to something that you mentioned right back at the start of our time together, which is not necessarily related to the book. 
but but you're really big on team and people. And so, you know, the people that listen to this show are building and scaling an actual business. And so just talk into that a little bit, like, like, how do you do, how do you do team slash fun slash loving on people in practical ways as an entrepreneur? Okay. I manage by walking around. And what I mean by that is in the mornings, I go into people's offices and I sit in front of their desk and I put my feet up or have a cup of coffee. And I just ask them like, how are you doing? How was your weekend? How's your wife or your kids or your grandparents, whatever, how's your dog, whatever they're interested. I know what they're interested in. And, and so, you know, I, I go around and, and talk to people and, and for five or 10 minutes and, you know, in, invariably somebody will say, Hey, I've got this issue. You know, what do you think about this? That's how, that's, that's my management style. I'm a collaborator. Every Tuesday we have an operations meeting and we get around this big table and, uh, you know, we go over the operations of the company. And my goal uh, when issues come up is to get consensus. Now, obviously the leader of any company is going to have to make the final decision, but, but it's, it's my goal that, the entry level person all the way to, you know, a vice president has a say at the table. And what I've learned over the years is that sometimes the entry level people have out of the box ideas that uh, people in long term in business would never think of. They say things like we've never done it that way. But if you're willing to learn and, exp- and say, well, what do you mean by that? Um, and and hear, hear examples it, you, you'd be amazed. Sometimes we'll bring uh, people out in the field in and say, we seem to be having this problem in this area of production. Do you have any ideas about how we could implement it? And every single time these guys, if you do this, if you do this, if you do this, and we would never think of it. So, so my, my, I think my job is, is to build a culture in a community where there's no stupid ideas, where uh, we can bring everything to the table. We can have a discussion about it. And I love it when I don't have to make the decision, when the team makes the decision, this is the direction we're going to go. Um, and it happens more often than not. And I'm really, really pleased with that. And that style has resulted in people working for you. Did you say like some of them are 30 years working for you? Yes. Yeah. I have people, I have people retire. When, I have a guy right now that's coming on 40 years. Um, there's there's uh, another uh, another gentleman who just retired after 20. I have a 36 year old kid who's worked for me for 14 years, and it's just amazing. Um, we don't have high turnover because what my what I'm hoping to do is raise the quality of life for my employees to give them a place to work that I want to work. I want to be part of a part of a team, part of the fellows. I want to be teased just as much as the next guy, right? And, and so we, we try to build that culture of honor based on love rather than fear. First John 4.18 says, love and fear can't coexist because fear has to do with punishment. And as you know, as a consultant, as a coach, that there's all businesses out there who are ruling by fear and who people are afraid to go to work. People are afraid to make mistakes. People are afraid to come up with new and innovative ideas. And that's the antithesis of what we as believers want to build in a company. So good. I've got one question that I ask everybody that we have on the show. Um, how is the kingdom of God advancing because of Bob Hassan's life? <laughs> well, um, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I'm just... I'm just so humbled to be part of God's kingdom and the fact that he's had so much mercy on me and my family and all that we touch is undescribable. I think about the fact that he shed his blood and hung on the cross for me and for you. doesn't make any business sense to me, uh, but what a deal it is. And so I, I think, I think, if I'm having any effect, it's 
transmitting the fact that God is so gracious and so good. And I'm just so grateful for him for that. I, I am willing to talk about my mistakes and they're really funny. I've made some really good ones, uh, but in spite of myself, God has brought, brought us to this place. So I'm, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, that's how I feel. I think it's a wonderful answer to the question and um, an incredibly attractive answer to the question at the same time. So, um, so yeah, God. All right, a, a couple of last things for our listeners. Uh, guys, I want you to buy the book. So go to Amazon, type in Bob Hassan, type in Shortcuts. Go buy it, right? It's there. Um, I'll be doing, I'll be going through the comments. <clears throat> like I said at the start, I'll send a bunch of them out to you guys. Uh, I'll probably buy some extras just in case you want to, you know, come and see me or something like that. You can grab some. Uh, Bob's really active on Instagram, right? So you can actually find him at, at bob.hassan. Uh, and he does a bunch of stuff there with Sean Bowles and it's really engaging content. So go follow him. You can check him out at bobhasson.com. That's H-A-S-S-O-N.com. Um, and one more final question. I know I said I had one more, but I've got two more. Uh, I intend to do a conference later this year in the US. And I'm wondering whether you would uh, consider coming to hang out with us personally with a bunch of I'm, kingdom entrepreneurs. Absolutely. And you know what? I've never been to Brisbane either. So if you have a conference there and our, our schedules, I would love to. I'll come and carry your bags. It'd be awesome. Oh, that's amazing. All right. Well, um, I think the team that are listening just wrote your name down, <laughs> immediately booked you in for something in the future <laughs> because because uh, I could hear them engaging in the background and, the, and, and they really enjoyed this interview as well. Um, well, well uh, I love you heaps, Bob. But it's such a good time to hang out like that and, and just chat things through. Um, wow. and, uh, yeah, I hope we get to spend a bit more time together. I do too. Thank I'm just so honored you had me. Thank you. And, um, Lord, I pray for Wes and all the, and the team and all the people listening, Lord, that you would give them the desires of their heart, Lord, that you, I know that you care about what we all care about. And so all the problems, all the issues, all, all, all the skirmishes that are out there that people are dealing with, I pray that you would give supernatural strategy. Lord, that, that you would be the God of practicality, that you would come into cash flow issues, to human resources issues, to people issues, to contracts, Lord, that you would, you would give the right contracts. God, that you would solve these problems in a way only you can, that doesn't make any sense. Lord, that we would all be able to testify, we're not smart enough to have had this uh, had this answer. God did it for us. And here's the miracle. And God, that in, in the kingdom podcast world and all the people that listen to Wes, he would have reports of testimonies of supernatural wins. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, that's the end of the episode. Please take uh, 30 seconds and put your top learnings in the comments and I'll be engaging with you there. Bless you and see you soon.